All God's blessings, everyone. This is a video worship service of Celtic Prayer for the week of Sunday, November the 8th, 2020. And my meditation is on the epistle reading for that Sunday. And uh, it comes to you from the parish of the Upper Canavacasis, outside of Sussex in New Brunswick, Canada. And I'm the Reverend Dr. Chris McMullen, uh, the retired priest in charge of this parish. Our liturgy this week uh, comes from the writings and the prayers of the very Reverend Dr. George MacLeod, the founder of the Iona community, a wonderful modern prophet, very much uh, one of the leaders in the revival and renaissance of Celtic Christian spirituality and Celtic Christian mission. He founded the Iona community in 1938. He wrote about this and its goals and its understanding of Christian mission and faith in a wonderful book called We Shall Rebuild, published in 1945, right after the war. He had served in the First World War and he had become a dedicated pacifist. Uh, this edition is reissued in 1962. It's hard to get hold of, uh, but you're... Um, it's worth looking for. Uh, he died in 1991. At that time, just before his death, a set of readings from his various many books, which are out of print now, called Daily Readings with George McLeod, was issued by Wild Goose Publications of the Iona community. The editor is Ron Ferguson, a member of that community. And this is widely available. It's been reissued in 2015 and uh, I recommend it. And many of the prayers also come from a wonderful um, anthology of George MacLeod's own prayers, issued in 1985, but still in print, again by Wild Goose Publications. The whole earth shall cry glory, uh, a collection of George MacLeod's prayers from Iona. So these are the resources from uh, for this service from George MacLeod. I've put together a bulletin of these uh, these selections that I've chosen, and it's on my script page. The link will be uh, provided in the first comment in the video uh, uh, on the YouTube site. So uh, have a look if you wish, and please, please enjoy. Our call to worship from McLeod's 1945 book, We Shall Rebuild the Work of the Iona Community. In Celtic days, they knew the early baptism. Gathered on the east bank of the river were the faithful, the ecclesia, those who were already drawn out from seeing the world with subhuman eyes, delivered from the natural decay that is the lot of all that is created. Gathered on the west bank were those who had been instructed in the faith, and who knew that in them as well there was a dying to be done and a burying. By the sacred act of baptism, they would be joined to the fellowship of all believers and shout with them the creed, We believe and sing the Te Deum Laudamus. In by J. Patterson. 1989, to the uh, Cuny Banks and Braes of Bonnie Dun. Candler, the musicians call it. O oh God, you gave your servant John a vision of the world to come, a radiant city filled with light, where you with us will make your throne, where neither grief nor pain shall dwell, since former things have passed away. And where they need no sun nor moon, your glory fills eternal day. 
Our cities wear great shrouds of pain beneath our gleaming towers of wealth. The homeless crouch in rain and snow, the poor cry out for strength and health. Youth's hope is dimmed by ignorance unwilling workers idle stand indifference walks unheeding by as hunger stretches out its hand come lord make ju real john's vision fair come dwell with us make all things new we try in vain to save our world unless our help shall come from you come strengthen us to live in love bid hatred greed injustice cease your glory all the light we need let all our cities shine in peace lord have mercy christ have mercy lord have mercy yea lord have mercy we know that you are the way for us but we do not like the steepness of the bray we know that you are the truth for us but we do not like the starkness of your word we know that you are the life for us but still we fear that days will be dull or too demanding if we gave up ours. Wilt thou not turn and quicken us that thy people may rejoice in thee? Make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You have renewed a right spirit within us. You have turned again and quickened us. You have climbed the bray. Calvary is one for all. Really and truly we believe your whole good news. Behold us, thy people who now rejoice in thee. The psalm I've chosen to pray and anticipate our epistle reading from uh, proper 32, year A, uh, the epistle reading for Sunday, November 8th, 2020, psalm I've picked is Psalm 96. And this is Eugene Peterson's wonderful paraphrase in the message. Sing God a brand new song. Earth and everyone in it, sing. Sing to God. Worship God. Shout the news of his victory from sea to sea. Take the news of his glory to the lost, news of his wonders to one and all. For God is great and worth a thousand hallelujahs. His terrible beauty makes the gods look cheap. Pagan gods are mere tatters and rags. God made the heavens. Royal splendor radiates from him. A powerful beauty sets him apart. Bravo, God, bravo. Everyone join in the great shout. Encore. In awe before the beauty. In awe before the might. Bring gifts and celebrate. Bow before the beauty of God. Turn then to your knees. Everyone worship. Get the message out. God rules. He will put the world on a firm foundation. He treats everyone fair and square. Let's hear it from sky. With earth joining in and a huge round of applause from the sea. Let wilderness turn cartwheels. Animals come dance. Put every 
tree of the forest in the choir. An extravaganza before God as he comes, as he comes to judge the earth, set everything right on earth, set everything right, treat everyone fair. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Spirit Holy, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And our scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, sisters and brothers, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage one another with these words. Father, speak your word to us. Jesus, be your word with us. Spirit, realize God's word in us. Amen. I want to say something about Jesus himself, about majesty being our destiny, about time and eternity, and togetherness. First, Jesus himself. Unlike a lot of deep and wise mystical spiritualities, and even the pre-Christian Duetic faith of our Celtic forebears in Celtic Christianity, the Bible doesn't talk about us dying and our spirit ooh, going off to heaven or something like that. The Bible talks about God himself in the person of Jesus coming to us when we die. It's not we go on a journey. Our journey is this earthly pilgrimage. Jesus comes to get us. What we have here is not some sort of a philosophy, not some sort of speculation based on mystical experiences. And I don't want to put any of those things down. But those things have to reconcile with science and be based on fact. And for Christians, the fact is that Jesus lived a life from his cradle in Bethlehem to his grave in Golgotha. And he was risen, raised from the dead. And he is alive now. We cannot see him, though by his spirit he is with us closer to us than our own breath. But this victory of Jesus over death itself and all that is evil and hateful against God's creation will be revealed, will be manifest. And it won't be by us going someplace. That kind of imagery. Of course, it's all symbol talk. But the symbol talk is, he will come to us. And this is what Paul speaks about. He says he gets it from the Lord himself, that he's heard the teaching of Jesus about the resurrection of the dead, about his coming in clouds of glory, like one like a son of man, Daniel 7. And uh, he um, passes this on. George MacLeod, the founder of the Iona community, was a great believer that the church must get out of its religious or spiritual boxes and re-engage the wider world. And his way of putting this was that we have to start taking the incarnation seriously. That the God of the universe became a creature, that the God of the universe became human, became a, a man. And what can that mean? And what does that mean for us? It's thrilling. It's glorious that 
This world is beloved by God, visited by God, and destined by God for glory. The new Jerusalem is this world, our earthly Jerusalem, transformed to be a fit place for God to dwell in person. He dwells here now. And we know that in hints and anticipations, especially in Celtic Christian spirituality, in our closeness with the saints, in our feeling the intimate presence and power of God and creation around us, the presence of the Holy Spirit within, and reading God's word and studying it all these ways. We have these hints and anticipations, but that's our destiny. But our destiny is Jesus will come to us. The first disciples, including St. Paul, expected Jesus to return within their own lifetime. And over the centuries, every generation, especially Celtic Christians, felt we're living in the last days and surely Jesus is to come. Now you can say they were all wrong, or you can say they were all correct in the sense that they all died. So they were all transported, this is my third point in a way, through kind of the eternal time machine of, of God's providence to that victory. And they all did, in a sense, they live in the last day, the Celtic saints with their missionary fervor and their sense of the closeness to God and the urgency of letting people know about Jesus, you know, and of growing in the holy life and becoming saints. And all of those Celtic saints have, in fact, experienced that. And all of us, whether it's here on earth when human history and cosmic history comes to its grand conclusion, or whether we're taken before then in our own natural death, we will experience Jesus coming to take us home. The second point is majesty and glory. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a, on a donkey to claim his throne on Palm Sunday, a servant of the people, surrounded by his followers. But Paul uses um, this sort of mystical language, doesn't he? About the clouds, reminding us of God appearing to Moses, or the Exodus, or Elijah, or Jesus the Transfiguration. The cry of command of the archangel's call, again reminding us of Mount Sinai and God's personal appearance, of the, the blast of God's trumpet. All of these are suggestions of majesty and glory and victory. I don't think we need to take them literally. Paul is speaking in simple talk, but he's trying to suggest the triumphant arrival and majesty of Jesus as king as the emperor, the way the emperor would arrive with all the pomp and circumstance, you know, uh, in the glory of God himself. The po word Paul uses here is Jesus appearing, his, in Greek, parousia. He also uses that, 1 Corinthians 5, 23, and it's become a technical term for scholars. The word parousia meant um, a mystical theophany of God appearing in the ancient world. It also referred to the arrival of an emperor or of a king, of a great leader to his people. Jesus is the king. Josephus used the word to describe God coming to redeem Israel and save Israel from all their enemies. God coming in person. Josephus used as a parousia. And this is the word that Paul uses, the personal appearing of Jesus in majesty. And he comes, and with all the saints, the dead in Christ will rise first. We will be caught up with them in the clouds. He doesn't come alone. He comes, as is pictured in the book of Revelation, if you remember. He comes surrounded by his saints, surrounded by his people. I think that's why he delays, because he wants each and every one of us to have a small share in that victory. And when he comes, that victory only won't only be his own conquest of death, but his victory over all kinds of evil and suffering and injustice. Vindicating, fulfilling, glorifying the small little victories in daily life of love and courage and integrity of his people, especially of his people who are in mission, 
George McLeod, this is another big team of his. The church had to become a missionary church. They could out there and win the world for Jesus. He, he's writing at the end of the Second World War. He had no illusions about how bad off the human story is. As I said, he served in the First World War. And it became, he became a pacifist out of that because he could see one more round of violence wasn't going to solve everything. Whether we agree with his pacifism or not, the point is that Jesus will have a victory, and that victory is to be known through love and witness and the courage of peacemaking. And George McLeod founded the Iona community and called the church to repent and renew and revive by the Spirit in order to bring this mission. He, he brought Celtic Christian missionary zeal back to the tired old institutional Church of Scotland. And I pray that this Renaissance and Celtic Christian spirituality will do that to all kinds of communities and manifestations of the church today. Now I want to talk a bit, just a minute for this phrase about the dead in Christ will rise first. We kind of take this in a chronological order, influenced as we are by the left behind books, you know, and kind of popular American um, fundamentalist piety. But Paul here is speaking in symbol talk. And his point is, he's addressing the Thessalonians, who, even though they're expecting Jesus to come any day, they've experienced death in their communities. And we've all known when we've lost great saints in our churches. We've been doing it for 2,000 years, so we're kind of used to it. But we know the, the tragedy and the sadness of it. And... Um, Paul's speaking to the Thessalonians about this and saying, those who have gone before us will rise first. Even though their bodies are still in the catacombs, Roman times, or buried, or wherever they may be, even lost at sea. And we haven't seen their resurrection yet, like Jesus' resurrection. Yet, they are already risen. Celtic Christians, following on uh, Druidic wisdom, had a great sense of the interplay of time and eternity. Eternity is a kind of a, 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 a time fullness, a fullness of past, present, and future, in always kind of present in, in, in vivid reality. And so St. Bridget could be baby Jesus in earth maid in Bethlehem, or St. Ida could pray that she would be able to nurse the baby Jesus herself in Ireland, you know, uh, 600 years later, and she did, according to the legend. This is because, of course, um, and the way that the, the saints appeared, you know, every, they had a sense that when we go to glory, we escape the linear limits of successive time, created time. Eternity is not a timelessness, or it's not just something in the future, it's a time fullness, where past and future are all as vitally present as present is for us now, minute by minute, in our existence. That's the timefulness of God's eternal trinity, love forever and ever. But that doesn't mean dead timelessness. It means an energy and a wealth of life. And we are destined for that. So when we die, to put it in science fiction language, one of the, the modern, you know, age people use mythology to talk, use simple talk to speak about uh, our destiny. That's the New Testament. But we could use the um, symbol talk of science fiction. It's like we go into a time machine when we die and we wake up in glory with all God's people. And yet we're able to see history unfolding, our own life and those who are left behind. And, uh, and we can be vitally with them, the communion of saints, you know. And so the Celtic Christians called on the saints to assist them on earth, even though they were in glory. It's all very mystical. But this is the biblical teaching. People used to dismiss it or make fun of it until Einstein and the new physics proved the relativity of time. Eh? That time, just like the other three dimensions, height, width, and depth, are all relative in, in the cosmos. But God is eternal, and everything is only relative to his providence and his purpose. George MacLeod was the inventor of the phrase, thin places. He, he heard it from some people, and he applied it to Iona, and eventually began applying it to other places, places where uh, 
earth and heaven are so close, we can feel God. And there are certain places that are set aside by prayer and by sanctity and by worship and the presence of the saints in such a holy way. I think we've all known uh, thin places. I hope for a lot of us, our, our churches, our home churches are thin places, or maybe someplace in the woods or wherever way it may be, maybe even the grave of a loved one. You know, but George MacLeod, we say, it was an idea amongst the early Celtic Christians that by prayer and discipleship and discipline and worship, the veil between time and eternity could be lifted. But it was George MacLeod that brought this into the modern Celtic Christian vocabulary. And our goal is that the dead in Christ will rise first, that we can have anticipations of that in all kinds of mystical ways. Lastly, I want to talk about we're all in this together. Paul uses the word together with Christ. He also concludes by saying, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage. Uh, the, the Greek word parakleto means uh, to encourage, to exhort, come on, come on, to cheer. It also means to comfort. In John's Gospel, chapters 14 and 16, it's sometimes translated the advocate, the noun version translated the advocate, to stand with, to stand beside, and to speak on their behalf. The Holy Spirit is our advocate, but we are to be advocates one another. We are to encourage one another. We're in this together. When Jesus comes, he'll come with all the saints to embrace us, and we'll be in the clouds with him. And here on earth, we're to be together and encourage one another in this way. So the Christian hope is not about pie in the sky and some other life, you know, and this world doesn't matter. No, the Christian hope is that this world will finally be set free from its slavery to decay and from the abuse and exploitation of its human stewards who have fallen away from our goal to be the world's gardeners and shepherds. And that Jesus will come and restore this life that we have known, the resurrection of the body. You know, not the soul going off somewhere else, but the resurrection of the body. George Mattel emphasized this incarnational reality. And you know, he was the inventor of the, the phrase, the Holy Spirit is to be symbolized by the wild goose. No evidence of that in early Celtic Christianity. It doesn't make it, doesn't make it a good Celtic Christian symbol for us modern Celtic Christians. During the First World War, George served with many Irish soldiers. And Irish soldiers in the First World War were called the wild geese. He, when he formed his Iola community, he called them the soldiers of Christ, using a, using a phrase from St. Martin, that early missionary that, whose work inspired so many Celtic Christians. He was a Roman soldier. And he used the phrase soldiers of Christ. And George MacLeod applied that to the members of his own community and to what all Christians should be. And so naturally he made the extra step and said, for us, we should think of the Holy Spirit not as a tame dove, but as a wild goose, brave, adventurous, on a journey. Back in my last parish that I retired from, there was a lay reader in the parish who was also a teacher at the local community college, Bob Britton, a deep, deep saint. Wonderful, close to Jesus. He had some of his own unique ideas. And one of them is that he didn't believe in life after death because he said, that's just a way of avoiding our responsibility here. And he, you know, all the stuff about life after death, he couldn't take that serious. When his mother died, you know, that kind of challenged him, but he still had a lot of objections to the idea that she was sitting in the garden somewhere playing a harp or whatever and all the rest of the thing. Anyway, in um, 2012, we began a Bible study of Tom Wright's wonderful book, Surprised by Hope. Surprised by Hope. This was published in 2008 by Harper Collins. 
And there Tom writes, right, writes about what the real Christian hope is. And Bob's part of that study group as we looked at it and try to get past, you know, the symbol talk of our spirits going off to a cloud somewhere to play a harp and back to the biblical Jesus, the idea that Jesus is coming to transform this world, to give us a new bodily life and to give us a share in the victory and the triumph of God's will for his creation. Now, I remember Bob saying to me, okay, I can believe in that kind of eternal, eternal life. Bob was a real saint in our parish, and a lot of us convinced him to study to be ordained as a deacon. And I'm going to get the dates right here. Where did I put the sermon notes? On November the 3rd, 2012, the Reverend Deacon Bob Britton was ordained in the Church of the Good Shepherd in St. John, New Brunswick. Shortly after that, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is usually, I think it's always, a death sentence. And in fact, he died on November 3rd, 23rd, sorry, March the 12th, 2013. He died on March the 12th, 2013. Visiting with this great saint who everybody loved, who was so gentle and yet so strong in his convictions about God's will for justice and God's command for us to love each other. He said to me, Chris, I'm ready for the resurrection. I look forward to seeing him coming in the clouds with Jesus at my resurrection, him and hundreds of other saints. May God bless us and keep us all in his resurrection grace. Amen. As usual, my dog's been coming and going during this experience. Mom just come home. So she's going to have to see if mom has any treats. We affirm our faith in some of the words of George MacLeod. This is from uh, the Ron Ferguson's edited book, Daily Readings with George MacLeod. What we find in the Bible, which differentiates our faith from all others it is precisely that God is to be found in the material, and that he came to redeem humanity, soul and body. The gospel claims the key to all material issues is to be found in the mystery that Christ came in the body and healed bodies and fed bodies and that he died in a body and rose in a body to save humans, body and soul. Christ is the key to every mortal thing. The baker simply knows that whole meal bread is better. The farmer, the farmer simply knows that organic agriculture is better. The psychotherapist simply knows that a human is a unity. The scientist simply knows that this unity is reflected in all nature. The really exciting thing for our day about Christ is that he is the emergent key for all this simple knowing. Christ comforts the baker in bereavement, the farmer in anxiety, the doctor in his emergency room, the scientist in his lab. But Christ's reign is not merely personal. Of course he heals souls, but he does all that because he is the cosmic key to all life. Let us pray with the words of George MacLeod from the whole earth shall cry glory. Let us pray for our own churches where we were brought up, where we now worship, of which we are grateful or proud. 
children in all the dross of clutching the gold, still forgiving, because they know they are forgiven. May we go about fearless, knowing that evil is conquered. Old folk, not afraid of crossing the board, and soaring folk, died of dear ones. May we not be bitter, knowing the old chair will not be empty forever. Young folk, distracted by passion and acquisitiveness, who have been stayed from lust or dishonesty, may we loyally remember what we learned of God's law through fellowship with humble, penitent, experienced older saints. We remember our church's frailties, too frail for the modern storm, too conformist to a dying world, too respectable to make the wretched feel at home. We ask you, Lord, to invade our churches, our church homes, that they may become careless of money and budgets, more careful of drunkards, more courageous for peace, more acquisitive in love. When we are tempted to speak critically of our churches, our homes, may we feel your silent gaze on us saying, what will you do to overcome the frailty of my church? And for a prayer of thanksgiving, also from the whole earth shall cry glory. Christ above us, Christ beneath us, Christ beside us, Christ within us, the Celtic came. Invisible we see you, Christ above us. With earthly eyes we see above us clouds or sunshine, gray or bright. But with the eye of faith we know you reign. Instinct in the sun ray, speaking in the storm, warming and moving all creation, Christ above us. We do not see all things subjected to you, but we know humanity is made to rise. Invisible we see you, Christ beneath us. With earthly eyes we see beneath us stones of dust and dross. But with the eye of faith we know you uphold. In you all things consist and hang together. The very atom is light energy. The grass is vibrant. The rocks pulsate in your love. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Christ beneath us. Sun's beaming in the window, as you can see. Inapprehensible we know you, Christ beside us. With earthly eyes we see people Exuberant or dull, tall or small, but with the eyes of faith, we know you dwell in each. You are imprisoned in the doper and the drunk, but you are there. You are released, resplendent in the loving mother, the dutiful daughter, the passionate bride, in every sacrificial soul, inapprehensible we know you, Christ beside us. Intangible, we touch you, Christ within us. With earthly eyes, we see ourselves, dust of the earth, earth of earth. But with the eyes of faith, we know ourselves, all girt about with the eternal stuff, our minds capable of divinity, our bodies groaning, waiting for the revealing, our souls redeemed, renewed. Intangible, we touch you, Christ within us. Christ above us, Christ beneath us, Christ beside us, Christ within us. It is so. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive each one of those who sins against us. And lead us not to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Let every heart's desire be joined to see the kingdom come. Let all the world sing with one voice. Let the people say, Amen. This hymn by June Voice Tillman in 1993 to the Irish tune London Derry Air. O Danny Boy. We shall go out with hope of resurrection. We shall go out from strength to strength go on. We shall go out and tell our stories boldly. Tales of a life that will not let us go. We'll sing our songs of wrongs that can be righted. We'll dream our dreams of hurts that can be healed. We'll weave a cloth of all the world united within the vision of new life in Christ. We'll give a voice to those who have not spoken. We'll find the words for those whose lips are sealed. We'll make the tunes for those who sing no longer. Expressive love alive in every heart. We'll share our joy with those who still are weeping. Raise hymns of strength for hearts that break in grief. We'll leap and dance the resurrection story, including all in circles of our love. Lord Jesus, you are above us reigning. We believe it. That is what gives us serenity to achieve. Lord Jesus, you are before us directing. We believe it. That is what gives us courage to go on. Lord Jesus, you are beneath us. We believe it. When we slip, you catch us. When we kick you in the face, you just serve us. You come further down just to be beside us. In awe, we thank you. Lord Jesus, you are within each of us. Our hope of glory, of being complete, we believe it. It is not just the interior of our church walls. It's our own inner beings you have renewed. So, we bless you. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the sun of peace to you. Amen.